Okay, this is going to be the third time I'm trying to make this video, and I guess that's a good thing because I'm calmer now than I was when I first did it. It's not fair to make a video that talks about Calvin's poison being derived from the Church Fathers without showing the poison of the Church Fathers. Um, I'm just going to do it. There is a... Well, I'm just going to go through this and I'll show you what I'm talking about. This, as you can see at the top, now highlighted in yellow, is a Catholic website. If you're going to show how something is wrong, you should always use the actual source materials. Okay? In other words, I'm not going to an anti-Catholic website to make this video. I'm doing it straight from those who believe in what I'm about to show you. And I'm going to show you why their belief is actually uh, uh, quite wrong, quite against the Bible, from their own words. That's the best way to audit a thing, is you don't go to the detractors. You go to the people who are supporting the position, and from their own lips, you demonstrate how a thing doesn't work. Okay? Now, this is going to end up showing the Catholic Church in an extremely bad light because this is the whole foundation of the Catholic Church right here. And I'm going to show you how they confess in their own words right here that what they're saying is false doctrine. I don't even have to go anywhere else except the Bible. So when I go to do this, it's going to become a, a great temptation to start railing at the Catholic Church like so many do. That is not the point of this video. The point of this video is to show how a thing is wrong. And quite frankly, the Protestants are making the same, doing the same thing. Okay? Hopefully I will remain calm about this because I really hate seeing obvious lies. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. Okay. Use 1 John 1.9 1, and that way you get God's brains to be alert to this. Um, and now we're going to go forward. Your first stop in proving that this is an apostasy is this word right here, church fathers. I don't know how aware you are, but when hypocrites or others are trying to take over or trying to make a bid for power, they use respectable language and they build themselves out uh, in a respectable manner and they use language to do that. Fortunately, if you know your Bible, you know that this is very wrong. To even use the word church fathers was something that the, the Lord himself said don't do. He said don't call anybody father. You have one father in heaven. Now when he's saying that, he's not talking about a physical father. Okay? He's talking about the term father that was used often by the Jews for their most respected rabbis. All right, and you can see that from the context because then he next talks about rabbis. All right, you have one teacher, the Holy Spirit, you have one father, your father in heaven. In other words, don't put anybody between God and you. All right, and unfortunately, these people are doing just that. These are our fathers. We're going to call them the church fathers. Of course, they usurp the word church, which does not mean what they claim it does. In the Bible, it means a body of believers. It is not an institution. It is not a hierarchy. It is not an ecclesiology. It is a body of believers. Ecclesia is the Greek word for um, synagogue, which is also a Greek word, which means the group of people. It is never talking about the institution. It's talking about a group of people. And it's also only talking about something local. If it's talking about a building at all, it was always a local congregation. Okay? And the Hebrew word is bet, and there are certain other Hebrew words that are used, but it's always talking about the group of people. It's not talking about the hierarchy. So, when they say church, they're misusing the word church, and when they say fathers, they're directly violating what the Lord warned against. So, right there, the whole word church fathers tells you that they are the fathers of apostasy. 
of apostasy because they're going against what the Lord said and they're going against the Bible definition of church. Right there. Right there. You don't even need to go farther in this page to know that this is apostasy talking, that these people do not represent God, that they represent Satan. And I'm, it's not just the Catholics who are guilty of this. This term is used by pretty much everybody in Christendom. So everybody in Christendom is turning their brain off to what the Bible says when they use this term. If they're the fathers of anything, they're the fathers of apostasy. Okay, and then we get to a different apos that is also ap you know, a, a, an apostasy. This whole concept of apostolic succession. This is a term that's invented by these people. Okay, but the Bible tells you, and quite bluntly, that in order to be an apostle, apostello is the Greek word, Greek verb for to send. Apostello is the Greek verb for to send. Apostolos, or apostolas, however you want to pronounce it, because people differ how they pronounce the, the Omicron. That is a cognate noun, and it means the one sent. And sent by whom? By God. The verb apostello is used in Exodus 3.14 in the LXX. And it's used by Christ as a sort of climactic statement. He was building up to it using uh, different words. He was using pempo in Greek prior, but in John 8 he builds up to using apostello, meaning sent by God. By God. Okay, well the apostles were appointed by God, the Son, when he rose. When he rose. In Acts 1 and at the end of each of the Gospels. Paul was appointed, what was it, Acts 7, Acts 8? Alright, Paul was appointed by the risen Christ. This is what qualified you as an apostle. You had to be appointed by the risen Christ. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15. The last two appointed apostles were James, the brother of Christ, because he became a believer after Christ died, and Paul. So there is no such thing as apostolic succession. Not anywhere in the Bible. Because you don't have a succession if the only appointer is God himself directly as the risen Christ appearing to you. So there is no succession. There is no apostles appointing other apostles. Apostello is coming solely from God. He personally has to do the appointing. So it's not just the Catholic Church, but it's all of these apostles, people calling themselves apostles. What you should do is go to them and say, oh really? Has the risen Christ appeared to you in your living room? The answer of course is no. Well, then I'm sorry you're not an apostle. So again, we have the twisting of the word church, we have the rejection of what Christ said about fathers, and we have the, the, the complete reversal of what is taught in the Bible about what an apostle even is. Okay, so this word here, succession, there ain't no such thing in the Bible at all, period, zero. And there are Protestants or, you know, non-Catholic sects out there who are busy trying to claim that they're apostles, they're all liars too. So these people, who in this case happen to be the Catholics, are all just flat liars. Right away, before I even get into the text, this whole idea and the words used are in flat contravention of the Bible. The Bible is God's word. There is no higher authority than the Bible except for God himself. Now, if you don't know that, or you dispute that, honey, I feel sorry for you. Because Psalm 138, uh, 2b says God puts the word above his own person. Greek word there is onoma. Shem is the Hebrew word. And it's, it literally is translated name. But it means his own person and his own reputation. Okay, that's why the word name is used. You know, for my good name. It means person and reputation. So watch this next cutting out of the Word of God. This, it just gets worse from here. It's very embarrassing. I feel sorry for these people. 
The early fathers believed. The early fathers believed. So, why why doesn't this phrase here in yellow say the Bible says? This should say the Bible says. See if they call themselves fathers to make themselves out to be something they're not except for fathers of apostasy. And then they talk about what they believed. They're putting themselves in a place of in place of the Bible. See, we have apostasy right here very obvious. And then our next apostasy just cuts out scripture. The early fathers believed that authentic teaching and authority came through apostolic succession. Who cares what they believe? What does the Bible say? Oh, well, the Bible doesn't matter. Do you understand? The Bible is being replaced by these alleged fathers. Is that embarrassing or what? The early fathers believe. Who cares? See, this is being used to support or justify, justify the position because they believed it. Yeah, and if they're all criminals, Hitler believed a lot of things. So if these people are criminals, but you call them fathers, their belief doesn't justify squat. But you're going to paper over the fact that they're not, you know, they don't belong. They aren't sent by God. See, apostle means sent by God. Not sent by another apostle. Sent by God. That's the Bible definition, 1 Corinthians 15. Look it up. So, what do I care about what these guys believed? And they're not fathers. They're calling themselves fathers or somebody else is calling them fathers. So see, here's more apostasy right there. And you're supposed to accept that? Yeah, if you don't know your Bible or you don't care about the Bible, you will accept that. And the first guy on the list, this is a killer. It's Clement of Rome. So now we come to <clears throat> Clement of Rome. Greek word, Clem, uh, Latin word Clemens is supposed to mean mild tempered or mild weather. And of course, the Catholics claim that the, the Clement that's mentioned in the Bible is the same guy as this one. Now, if you put your thinking cap on, you realize that they've just finished condemning themselves when they say that. Because Paul writes at the end of 2 Timothy to Timothy that everybody except Luke deserted him. So if Clement was with Paul, as is claimed by the Catholics, if Clement was with Paul, if this Clement was with Paul, and as you can see it's a nickname so it could be any Clement, if this Clement was with Paul, he deserted Paul. Because only Luke was with Paul. So this is not a good guy. He's either not the Clement that they claim he is, okay, or if he was the Clement that they claim he is, he deserted Paul. So see, when people are lying to you, they give themselves away. They use, they twist words like the word church is not what it is in the Bible. They, they violate what the Bible says about the word like fathers and up, up, apostle. Okay? They supplant the words with their own power grabbing. The early fathers bleed. Yeah, see, it doesn't say the Bible says. It says the early fathers believed. And then they insert so-called fathers, which are really usurpers. And the very things they tell you, tell you how to prove them liars. This is how I caught the KJVO. In their own mouth, they prove themselves liars. Well, the same thing is true here for the Catholics on this topic. I'm not trying to say that everything in Catholicism is wrong, and I'm not trying to say that Catholicism doesn't, you know, shouldn't exist. I'm saying that this is the foundation of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's a lie, and it's a provable lie from the Bible itself, starting with this guy, Clement. There is a Clement mentioned, but it's a common name like John Smith. 
Okay, and if they claim that this Clement is their Clement and that their Clement was with Paul, well, everybody deserted Paul and the second Timothy. Go look it up yourself. The only one who stayed with him was Luke, and that's why Paul was writing to Timothy and asked Timothy to bring who? Mark, not Peter. Mark. Mark was with Peter in Babylon, in Babylon, at the end of First Peter. So Peter was not in Rome. And then Mark is requested by Paul, who is in Rome, under guard, finally being sentenced by Nero, knowing he's going to die. He writes to Timothy, not Peter, asking Timothy to bring Mark. Well, Mark was not in Rome then. So neither was Peter, because Mark was with Peter in Babylon with the diaspora, the Jews in the diaspora from the first temple. There's a whole bunch of Jews that in the first after the diaspora of the first temple remained in Babylon. Okay, that's in Mesopotamia. You know, right where Iraq is. Okay, down toward the, the you know the the water. Alright? So this Clement is not is bogus. Okay, or if he's the real same Clement he was a jackass. He deserted Paul. And the Bible tells you that. Now, but you don't know if this Clement of Rome, first of all, was really Clement of Rome, or if he might have been a nice guy and somebody after he dies takes on his name, just like the pharaohs would erase the cartouche of their predecessors and then claim all the glory of their predecessors for themselves. That was a frequent... Um, and very famous thing that the Ramses did. The Ramses would always wipe out somebody else's exploits and then write their own cartouche over it and try to claim credit. Okay, so you don't know if there's a real Clement who is a nice guy, who's somebody coming after him as a usurper. See, this tells you that they're usurpers. These are all liars, whoever they really are. Okay? So there could have been a usurper who adopted the name Clement to mask himself and pass himself off as, a, as, as some Clement who was actually a nice guy. Okay? You don't know who this guy really was. And there is a great deal of debate as to who actually wrote um, First Clement, whether it was really Clement or not, and who Clement really was. Again, it's a common name like John Smith. All right, but we know whoever actually wrote this letter to the Corinthians called one Clement, that's its nickname, is a liar, a cheat, a usurper, and a power grabber. And you know that from the very content of the letter. You can get it at earlychristianwritings.com. Okay, I just bought their CD, but I've been reading their website for years. And I read there. I read this when I did my PopeMyth.htm years ago. Okay. Now notice the date of this letter. Remember, this is a Catholic website. I'm not using an anti-Catholic site to justify what I'm saying. I'm using their own source materials, and these are supposed to be quotes by their own supposedly respected fathers. Yeah, fathers of apostasy. And how do we know that's true? How do we know brain out isn't just being full of invective? And I'm mad because I hate to see lying. Okay, it's only because of the lying that I'm mad. I'm not trying to trash the Catholic Church or get rid of it. I just, the lie ought to be admitted and, and done away with. Look at the state. This is a Catholic website. I want to stress that. The Catholics are saying this is when Clement of Rome was written. And, of course, they treat it as really Clement and really of Rome. They ignore the dispute. They say that whoever this guy really was, he called himself Clement, he was really a church father. Yeah, okay. Then look at the date that he writes this. A.D. 95. Now, why is that important? We'll cover that in the next segment. A.D. 95. 
1895, John was still alive or had newly died, having been exiled on Patmos by Domitian. Domitian was the Emperor of Rome at the time, and he was involved in a periodic uh, rounding up of Christian leaders in order to make an example of them. And it was very common at that time to do something um, which we would call in modern day miming. That is a silent play that acts out movements in order to burlesque a particular thing. In, the, in this case, they were burlesquing Christianity. It was a very common thing to do at dinner parties in Domitian's empire. Now, whether it was Domitian who sponsored that kind of burlesquing or whether he was responding to it by exiling Christian leaders, I don't know. I haven't done enough uh, study on it. But if you look up, for example, in Britannica's um, Encyclopedia Britannica, at least my hardback copy from 1985 on their uh, history of drama, that's where you find this kind of information. You don't find it typically in Christian websites or uh, pastors. But everybody knows that uh, John was exiled by the mission on Patmos, except for the Calvinists who, you know, aren't too good at reading history. Clement, therefore, is writing this letter either just after or just before, well, just after uh, John is exiled or dies. Okay, there is a claim by other church fathers that John survived Patmos, but there's no evidence of that whatsoever. And as you're going to find out here, that's not too likely. Now, it's really important to stress this. He makes this statement here, which you can read at earlychristianwritings.com for free or order their CD, which I recommend, because that way you can search everything better. He writes this in chapter 44, that's where this quote is located, and it's decently enough translated. In chapter 44 of his <clears throat> letter to the Corinthians, which I'm going to discuss more in a minute, it's 8095. John is still alive or newly dead from being exiled on Patmos. Do you know that in this letter to the Corinthians, John's name isn't mentioned even once? The only apostles mentioned in this letter are Peter and Paul. Nowhere in that letter does it say anything about popes. Nowhere in that letter does it say anything about Peter being a pope. And you can go read it for yourself. <clears throat> it's in Greek in uh, Calvin College. You can find it in the Greek there. In earlychristianwritings.com you can find the translation by Lightfoot and by two other people. Two or one other guy. All right? There's no mention of John. John is therefore being snubbed. Snubbed. It is a, especially in that culture at that time, when you wanted to snub somebody, you refrained from even mentioning their name. So Paul and Peter are mentioned in this <clears throat> letter to the Corinthians, very long letter to the Corinthians, and John is left out. Now let me ask you a question. If this guy had good intentions, if this guy were really from God, and John is alive on Patmos, or newly dead even, having just finished Revelation, then John would be mentioned in the letter. And it was a practice, especially a Roman practice, of, uh, it's, it's called haughty exclusion to not mention the name of somebody who is in disfavor. It's really important to say that. Okay, you have to know something about Roman culture at that time to understand how important this is. You mention the people who you are honoring and you dishonor people by not mentioning them at all. They're beneath mention. We even have that practice in English. John is not mentioned in the letter. Now, John, we know, is an apostle. John wrote four books of the Bible. Okay? So, if Clement was from God, Clement wouldn't snub John. Now, 
what's very interesting and makes me think that the, the Re book of Revelation is actually in response to this letter, but I can't prove it, is that the book of Revelation will not mention Rome. Does not mention Rome. It mentions seven churches in Asia, Revelation 1 through 3, and it doesn't talk about Rome until Revelation 17. And yes, it is Rome that's being talked about. The most famous name for Rome by the Romans is their founding name that the Romans called themselves, which were the seven hills. Those were the seven initial populations of colonies from which the patriarchs came. They called themselves the seven hills, and that is the name by which they are called in Revelation 17. It cannot mean anybody else. And so when Rome is mentioned by God to John on Patmos in this year or just before or just after, it's in a very negative context. And Clement is not mentioned at all. Again, that's the Roman practice of snubbing. When John writes his gospel, he writes it with Roman time, for example. That's why it differs when it talks about the crucifixion. Roman time ran three hours different from um, Jewish time. In other words, it added three, three uh, hours because it started from midnight to midnight. And um, I think it was, I might be mischaracterizing it, but it is definitely Roman time that uh, John is using in his gospel to record the crucifixion. He's using the whole, he's using, John is using Roman standards. John is mixing it, the, it with Roman standards when he writes. Okay? So he's using the Roman practice of snubbing in Revelation 17. It's very obvious. Okay? Because it's very nasty what's said about Rome. Okay? And Clement is not mentioned at all. At all. In fact, none of these people, Ignatius was alive at the time. Okay, he's not mentioned either. Anywhere in the Bible. And Clement really isn't mentioned anywhere in the Bible either. But, you know, like I said, you know, the, the Roman Catholics try to claim that the Clement that is mentioned in the Bible with Paul is this Clement. Okay, fine, if he was this Clement, he deserted Paul. So therefore, this isn't a guy that you want to you want to listen to. He's apostate. He deserted Paul. Okay, AD 95. The same guy, whoever is calling himself Clement, and it might not be a really really Clement. It might be somebody else, you know, slapping Clement's name on it, and that's the big you know conundrum in scholars today. They wonder if Clement was really Clement. Okay, but whoever's calling himself Clement in the letter of the Corinthians, okay, is snubbing John, snubbing John, and Revelation 17 is snubbing all of Rome, and not mentioning one person who's part of it. You understand? Snubbing it. 8095, baby. And the prediction, of course, that's in Revelation 17, everybody and his brother knows, came true. And it's not just true for the Catholics anymore either, of course. Everybody's his own pope nowadays. Okay? So that's your next big red flag you had. This is your red flag. This is your red flag. This is your red flag. Bible, con Bible refutes all of those words. And this, replacing scripture, your next big red flag. This, your next big red flag because this guy deserted Paul. This is your next big red flag because it's in Revelation 17, not Revelation 1 through 3. This is your next big red flag because it's written at the same time as Revelation, just before or just after. And your next big red flag is that John's name isn't even mentioned in the letter. If John had just been exiled or died, he should have been honored, not snubbed. So are you going to be surprised that our next big red flag is this guy is trying to make a power grab by making a claim? Our apostles? Hello? He's snubbing John. Our apostles? Whose apostles? Their apostles. His apostles. Not God's apostles. 
See, he's name dropping and, and scripture dropping throughout his letter, and he uses scripture like droppings. He just quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes to show how much he remembers. But it's got no meaning to it. He just piles up scripture on scripture for no purpose. He's just showing off. This is a really bilious letter. It makes me throw up when I read it. Our apostles. Our apostles. Not God. Not the Bible. Our apostles. Well, it's not God's apostles because John isn't mentioned in the letter. Our apostles knew through our Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> that there would be strife for the office of bishop. Where does that say so in the Bible? Strife for the office of bishop? That's not what it says. What it says routinely in the Bible, that there will be strife trying to take you over, that there will be false teachers. False teachers, not strife for the office. Okay? Strife for the office? Yeah, these, this is the guy who's making the strife right here. This is the guy who's guilty of the very thing he's talking about. They're not his apostles. His apostles are Satan. Satan's apostles. Because look, here's how you know. For this reason, therefore, having received perfect foreknowledge, really, they appointed those who have already been mentioned. They, the apostles, not God. The Bible tells you that only God does the appointing. That's what apostello means. That's where we get the word apostle. But he's now claiming something that the Bible contravenes, that the Bible contradicts, and says that the apostles appointed those. Oh, yeah? Then making further provision that if they should die, other approved men should succeed. Where is that in the Bible? Where is that in any piece of writing? This guy's just asserting it because he wants, he wants to grab power over the Corinthians. This guy is a power grabber. Whoever's playing Clement of Rome is a power grabber. And all you have to do is read his letter to know that. He starts out with psychophantic, hypocritical, um, you know, praise. And then he digs in the knife. And then he has verbal diarrhea with scripture for about 43 chapters. And then he finally makes his power grab right here in chapter 44. It's really bilious. Go read it yourself. And then contrast this letter with what Paul wrote to the Corinthians and you'll know why the Corinthians were bucking against whoever this usurper was writing in the same year that John was already writing on Patmos this usurper who didn't even mention John's name in his letter his letter is like fifty some chapters long I forget exactly how long I was throwing up the whole time I read it go read it yourself they appointed they appointed really where do you have that in writing? It's certainly not in the Bible. In the Bible, only God did the appointing, and you had to see the resurrected Christ, and He personally appointed you from His resurrected body. Just like you see at the end of each of the Gospels. Just like you see Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15. So see, all this right now is just, these people are condemning themselves. If you know the Bible, you know that they're lying. I want to focus on a few more really important topics that are related to this date of writing. In AD 95, John was still on Patmos, or, you know, had newly died, had just finished writing Revelation, etc. The claim, as I explained in my PopeMyth.htm, the claim by the alleged church fathers is that Peter was a pope. If Peter was a pope, then why wasn't John a pope? Because Peter was dead at this point. It wouldn't have been Clement. It would have been John. And why doesn't Clement mention John? And of course, like I said before, why didn't Clement mention Peter as a pope in his letter? Or even Paul. If anybody should have been a pope, it should have been Paul. Okay? But there's no mention of them as popes. There's no mention of them as bishops. There's no mention of them anywhere in this connection. And no proof whatsoever. If they appoint, if there was such a thing as succession, that it would have been provided in the Bible 
at least as a postscript at the end of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, if John was appointing somebody, if there was a succession, it would have said in the epilogue of Revelation 22, 6-21, there would have been something saying, appoint. So all of this is one great big fat lie. Proven so by the very Bible at the very time written. Okay? There are no popes mentioned. Peter doesn't call himself a pope. Paul doesn't call himself a pope. Clement doesn't call him, call him a pope. Clement doesn't even mention John. If anybody should have been a pope at that year, it should have been John. John was writing scripture. Clement didn't write any scripture. Clement makes up this story in order to try to take power over the Corinthians because they weren't listening to him. Just read the letter yourself. So if anything, this guy, if he was really so much of a church father, why didn't he write scripture during the very year scripture was being written by John? Hmm? And why is there no mention of him? Hmm? If he's such a good guy. And if there was an appointment, how come it's not mentioned in the Bible in the very year this guy is writing? Huh? Do you begin to smell a rat? Now the claim was that Peter Boy was in Rome, that he died in Rome, <clears throat> and that he was a pope for 25 years. 8095, John is dying. If Peter was a pope for 25 years but died at the same time as Paul, Paul was deserted by everybody except Luke. That's at the end of 2 Timothy. So then Peter would have deserted Paul too, if Peter was even in Rome. Paul died in the year of the four emperors. He died about four months before Nero died. Okay? Nero died, it looks like a uh, spring of AD 60, um, AD 69, AD 68. I'm not really quite sure. I have to redo the math there. Okay, he died sometime after January 1. That's kind of the problem. All right? So Clement wasn't with Paul when Paul died. Everybody had deserted Paul except for Luke, you know, when Paul was about to die. And that's why he asked for Timothy at the end of 2 Timothy and Mark, not Peter. And if someone tries to say, well, Peter was there, okay. If you say Peter was there, Peter had deserted Paul. So what kind of pope was he? I'm sorry. But there's a rat here. Once a person lies, they get trapped up in their lies and their excuses. This is AD 95. John is alive. How come... Our boy John isn't a pope replacing Peter instead of this guy. See, this guy's a usurper. That's it. And he didn't even mention John. And if Peter had been pope, then this guy should have said so if Peter had been pope 25 years, ending with approximately the same year that Paul died. And how come Paul wasn't the pope? And how come both of them were in Rome, according to the Catholics? Not according to the Bible. The Bible says that Peter was in Babylon. End of Second Peter. And Mark was with him. End of First Peter. And Mark was with him. And Second Peter followed close on First Peter. And Second Peter was written from Babylon, which at that time was called Parthia. And the guy that, that was the king of Parthia was partial to Nero. He loved Nero. He's one of the few kings who liked Nero. So obviously when Nero started rounding up the Jews a second time, which resulted in Paul's arrest, because Paul was released the first time, then that prompted Nero's allies to, allot, to round up Christians too, and that's how Peter died in Babylon, in Parthia, not Rome. Therefore Peter didn't desert Paul, because Peter was never in Rome. But this guy allegedly was, and therefore deserted Paul. You see how this works? If Peter was in Rome, he deserted Paul. 
And if anybody was supposed to be a pope or a church father, it should have been John, not this guy. And it says here, added the further provision that if they should die, other approved men should succeed. Okay, where is that in the Bible that was then just written? Where is that in any piece of writing from any of the apostles? Nowhere. This is an assertion by a usurper who's calling himself Clement. They can't call it anything else. The Bible condemns him. The Bible contradicts him in every single way you want to name. There was never, ever an office of bishop. There was never, ever strife for an office of bishop. There was never an ecclesiastical hierarchy, even in the Old Testament. You had the Sanhedrin, which was a civil body, and yeah, it was run by rabbis because they had do two hats. There were civil authorities for judging court cases, and they were also, you know, because you had to judge it according to the Mosaic Law, and they were also priests. The two offices were separate, but they were held by the same person. Because you had to use the Mosaic Law for court cases, too. Because it was tripartite in nature, the Mosaic Law. Okay? So there was no, the Sanhedrin was not an ecclesiastical office. It was a civil office headed by Moses, who was not a priest. Aaron was the priest. So see, all this is a lie. The Bible refutes it from the Old Testament forward. All this is a lie. He's not producing any evidence whatsoever of any named apostle actually doing the appointing. He's just claiming it, and the Corinthians were bucking him, and that's why. Go read the letter to the Corinthians by Paul and contrast it with Clement. And pay real close attention to the fact that this is A.D. 95, according to the Catholics. <clears throat> Alright, so now let's move to our next criminal, who's calling himself, and it might not be his right name, Ignatius of Antioch. Look at this. If this isn't a blasphemy, I really don't know how to define blasphemy. You all must follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father? Have you ever read a more blasphemous statement in your life? The bishop is being equated with God the Father? You know what that is. That's the same crap as this thing here. I'm sorry. You can't call this kind of blasphemy by a nice name. Instead of saying the Bible says, it says the early fathers believed. Replacing the Bible. You get that? Oh, well, that's not good enough. We cut Christ's head off in Matthew 16:18. So let's make the bishop as good as God the Father. What did Christ say? Don't call anybody Father except your Father in Heaven. And what, therefore, is this verse doing? This writing by Ignatius, supposedly, doing? It's violating what Christ said. It's saying you got to treat the bishop as God the Father. Christ said don't call anybody Father except God in Heaven. And this guy is saying the exact opposite. Exact opposite. Why is it that anybody in his right mind would praise this person? This is a person you should shun. This is a person you should be making videos against. Same thing with this guy. The very fact that anybody praises these people proves that they hate the Word of God. This guy is violating the Word of God right here. Follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father? Excuse me? And oh, it's not Christian love if we speak against these people. Really? Well, they're not showing a whole lot of Christian love for the Father. There's no Christian love for the Father here. There's no Christian love for the Bible here by using the term church fathers when Christ said don't do that. There's no love for God the Father here when only God appoints you as an apostle and they're trying to claim a doctrine that the Bible refutes because only God does the appointing. Hmm? There's no love for God or His Word here. The early fathers believe that's replacing the Bible. Do you understand how evil this is? There's no love for God here when John isn't even mentioned and he's just been newly exiled or dead. There's no love for God here to say they did this appointing when there's no proof of it whatsoever and the Bible contradicts it. 
The Bible speaks of Rome in bad terms, not good terms. So why aren't we speaking of these people in bad terms? Why are we letting them get away with it? 